So here, this is a story of Puranjan. So we are at the very end of the story. At the end of the story, there is a de depiction of a conversation between the soul and the Lord. It's the Lord has appeared, and the Lord is speaking to the soul. So this is the soul of King Puranjan, who was a powerful king, who it is described that in his previous life, he became a he, he became attached to a woman who was a queen, he married her, he had children. Then he was attacked by an invader and he died. And in his next life, he becomes a woman. He becomes Vaidehi. He's married, he's married to a king. And then that king dies. So now she has become a widow. She is alone. And it is her soul that is approached. She is lamenting at the death of her husband. At that time, the Lord appears in the form of a Brahmana. And then the Lord speaks to her certain words of wisdom. And those words comprise this conversation. So this is the fourth candle, 28th chapter, text 53. It goes on till the end of the chapter. 64 and 65th is Narad Muni is telling the story to King Prakini Parishad. So that's a summary. So this section from 53 to 64 is what we will be covering in the next three days. And we'll discuss some of the verses. So I'll be taking these verses as starting points. I will try to overall understand you know, what is the dynamic of bhakti? How does it work in our lives? So the three sessions which we're going to have. So basically, say we are here in this world. We we'll call this the material world. And this has its ups and downs. And above us is the spiritual world. Here at the top, there is the Lord. And we are functioning in the world. So the three sessions that we are going to have discussion. First is that how do we perceive the Lord in this world? Now, does the Lord really exist? Does the Lord really care? How does knowing the Lord and trying to connect with the Lord? So, how do we perceive? We, normally speaking, a person does it suddenly turn and look up at God. Most of the times, we are trying to face the challenges of life. And while facing the challenges of life, we look for resources. What can help me? And that's when we sometimes look up. So initially, even when we look up, it is not because we are primarily interested in what is up. We are interested in what is in front of us. And to gain help in facing what is in front of us, we look up. So the first level will be that we appreciate the Lord's presence in the world. The Lord's kindness, the Lord's love in this. Then after that, so this will be a three parts, three sessions we are going to discuss, and we will quick map of what we are going to discuss. So once we appreciate, then we start connect. Okay, let's go forward here. When we appreciate, then we connect with the Lord. So connect means okay, how do we practice bhakti? How do we develop a relationship with God? So we'll talk about different degrees of connection from mixed devotional service to pure devotional service. And then towards the end, eventually what happens is that we finally, we target the Lord. Target doesn't mean we want to shoot the Lord, not target practice. But target means we make the Lord the target of our even when we connect, it may be so that the Lord can make my life better in this world. So, it is an incremental process. 
when we start developing our relationship with the Lord. Till Vasudeva Sarvamiti. Normally, this takes Bahunam Jalmana Mahiti, as the Bhagavad Gita says. This takes many lifetimes. When all begins first, we appreciate that God is here. God is playing a role in my life. God is helping me. So let me try to have a relationship with him. And not just a relationship. It can be one relationship among many relationships. And eventually, he becomes our most important relationship. So this is how our discussion over the next three sessions is going to flow. And we'll discuss two, three verses from the series that we're going to discuss as we move forward in this development of thought as it relates with the Lord. So this is the acronym ACT, A-C-T. Ultimately, Bhagavad Gita or even the Bhagavatam, it's not just abstract philosophy. It's a philosophy which is calling us to do something. In the case of Arjuna, it was to raise his weapons and fight for Krishna. In the case of Parikshit, it was sit and focus on remembering the Lord. But even that is an action. Both were actions to connect with the Lord, to become absorbed in the Lord. So ultimately, Shastra is not just an abstract theory. It is a worldview that calls us for action. And it is that action that we will try to understand. And we see how the discussion of the philosophy can inspire us to come closer to the Lord, to act in a way that we come closer to the Lord. So, let's look at some of the verses over here. So what happens over here? Just quickly. Is this visible to many of you? So here, it's not Vide, it's Vaidarbi is the king. Vaidarbi is the queen, the daughter of King Vidarbi is called Vaidarbi, her husband, King Malay Dhaja. So <clears throat> Malay Dhaja goes to the forest and Malay Dhaja performs meditation, he enters into dhyana and he departs from the world. So in this way, King Maladvaja attained perfect knowledge. Because in his pure state, he was directly instructed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. By means of such transcendental knowledge, he could understand everything from all angles of vision. Basically, he became enlightened. And then he left his body. Now she had gone with him to the forest. She had been a dedicated wife. But now she was all alone in the forest. Now... When Malayatvaja had dedicated himself to the Lord, the Lord did not abandon those whom Malayatvaja cared. So the Lord came there to help his wife. And the Lord came in the form of a Brahmana. And so a daughter of King Vidarbha continued as usual to serve her husband, who was seated in a steady posture until she could ascertain that he had passed away from the body. So he had a very peaceful departure from the world. And although the departure was peaceful, still for her, it was traumatic. Once she knew that her husband had renounced the world and come to the forest, ultimately, it is the final stage of life. But still, bereft of her husband's company, she felt exactly as a deer feels upon being separated from its pain mate and she was all alone and she started shedding tears and says, oh my husband please get up please come back I cannot live without you and as she was lamenting in this way my dear king one brahmana it's interesting the way the Bhagavatam puts it let's recite the words tatra purvatara kashche <laughs> So Tatra, at that particular time, when she was lamenting Purvatara from the past, from some distant past, Sakha Brahmana Atmavan. So a Brahmana was a Sakha, a friend of that particular king, Atmavan. 
So he was a very wise person, Atma. Santavayan Valguna Samna. So Santavayan. Santavayan means to pacify. So Valguna is sweet, soft words. In the Gopi Gita it describes Madhura Yagina Valgu Vakya so Krishna has a sweet voice and he speaks soft words. So this Brahmana has come here in very with sweet words. What is he doing? Sam, I started speaking. Sam ah rudalin prabho. Sam ah, this person, the ah is to speak. Rudati, Rudati means to cry. So she who was crying, he started speaking to her. And now she's all over the forest and this, this Brahmana has come. She'll actually have questions. Who is he? So, Brahmana Vacha. Katvam Kasya Siko Vayam. So, in general, it is a, when our emotions are getting very strong, at that time, telling the emotions, they don't get angry. Don't feel so sad. Don't get so agitated about this. That doesn't work. One of the powerful ways of managing our emotions is not instructing, but questioning. It means, if say our child has come from a park and child is very angry, don't be angry. We say, that, because that doesn't work. Okay. What exactly are you angry about? What happened? Even if the child may be angry and not be able to answer. But generally, okay, what has got you so angry? So ask questions. Questioning makes us start thinking. So the Brahmana, when he comes, he's asking, Katwam, so who are you? So who are you? Whose wife or daughter are you? Who is the man lying here? Shayano yasya shochasi. Shayano yasya shochasi. So, okay, I keep the Sanskrit English both. What do you prefer? So, who, who is this person for whom you are lamenting? Yana Sikim Sakhayam Maam. So, do you recognize me? I am your Sakhayam. So, I am your friend. So, previously it was said that he was a friend of the Brahm, the husband. But now it is said he is her friend also. So, who is this Brahmana? It is a law. The super soul who is manifesting externally. Ye na gre vichacharthaha. So, ye na gre. So, vichacharthaha means you have consulted me in the past. You have turned to me in the past. It's not, this is not our first meeting. Sometimes when we meet someone, and it's a little embarrassing if that person recognizes us and we don't recognize that person. And then, okay, but then that person may help us remember. You met before. You remember that particular place we met, that particular time we met. So, yena agri So, in this way, he starts the conversation by telling, I am your friend. And you have met before. So, for all of us, we all face some situations in life when we start questioning what is going on. Now, whatever we may have, held to be of value, then it is shaken or taken away from us. And then we start questioning. So basically, death, uh, especially the death of someone whom we are very close to, that is a time when we start at least for a brief while thinking of some bigger question. What? You know, what really matters in life? See, for all of us in life, if this is a life journey, everyone has to have something that is the artha of them. Now, artha has two meanings. One artha is meaning. One artha of artha is artha. So you can say it's meaning. The other is value. Like we have artha mantri, finance. Dharma artha kama moksha is its value. So, for all of us, there is something that is of value for us. 
So it could be our business, it could be our looks, it could be our reputation, it could be our family, it could be our loved one. And that is why when something bad happens in local life, sometimes say anartha When you say in philosophical language, when you say anartha, it refers to karma pro the logo. And we'll talk about the relationship between the two. But when in normal language in Hindi say, Bada anartha ho gaya. Have you heard this word? Bada anartha ho gaya. What it means is essentially that which we consider to be artha, that has been taken up or that has been shaken, that has been damaged. So all of us have something which we consider to be artha. And when that artha is, is endangered or is lost, that's what makes us think. What am I to do with this? How am I to deal with this? So that is the time we may start looking upward. Now, is there someone up there? Is that person really, is whatever is up there, is that in charge? And so when Artha, it is taken away, there are two ways we can go. One is, we can go toward anartha. Now, anartha does not necessarily only mean lust, anger, greed. Anartha essentially means that which has no value, but we think it is of great value. See, when there is when there is a greed or when there is anger, so what happens is at that time, controlling the other person, putting the other person in their place. Now, causing pain to the other person becomes the most important thing. Even if it means it's going to hurt our relationship, even if it's going to, it means it's going to ruin the relationship, even if it means that it's going to ruin our reputation in society. So alcoholism, it's another thing. What does it mean? At that time, the person sees a bottle. There is going to be a corporate meeting. And they are in the meeting. And they talk, their boss is talking with them and in their mind, the boss body changes into a bottle of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does anartha do? Anartha, it basically distorts our value system. So, anartha essentially means that which has no artha, we start thinking it has huge artha. So, that which is of no value or very low value, then we start thinking it is the most important thing. So either artha is taken away, we can go into anartha. Some people sink into bitterness. Some people start going to hatred. Or at that time, we can move towards paramartha. So when artha is taken away, at that time, either we can go to anartha or we can go toward paramartha. And that is a decision which we all have to make in life. Now we will talk about does this decision happen when only when the artha is taken away? We will talk about that a little later. So generally it works in two ways. Quickly I'll just mention it. When artha is there, there are broadly two ways, two situations when we may start thinking of alternatives. There could be devastation that means the artha is just taken away from us. Or there can be disappointment. Disappointment means that, okay, I got this, but it is not all that good. You know, I, want to become, I wanted to become famous. I wanted to become, I want to win this award, win this competition. I wanted to achieve a big house. I want to get this much bank balance. I got it. But there's nothing, nothing all that great about it. It's nice. So this devastation means what happens is the opposite of what has to be expected. So our expectation was this way and the event turns out to be opposite. The other is disappointment means our expectation was this way and the event that happens, it turns out to be the same direction but it turns out to be much smaller. It's like... You know, somebody makes a relationship the whole focus of their life. You know, people have this idea. Oh, is there a 
yes, is there a perfect match for me? Okay, Mr. Right or Miss Right for me? And okay, I if I can just find a perfect partner, then my whole life will be. As they say, the like love is blind, but marriage is an eye opener. <laughs> What that means is, when there is a romantic hormones going through, we imagine that person to be something very, very special. Now, if that person is good, then nobody can live up to our expectations of what they are going to. So at that time, when whatever we had pursued as Artha, either it is taken away or it does not live up to our expectations. That is the time, either we can go upward or we can go down. That when the Artha doesn't work out, there's nothing in it. Just forget it all. <laughs> or we can go towards Paramartha. So it can go either way. But we can go towards Anartha or we can go towards Paramartha. So, for example, somebody achieves a success in a career. Now achieves success in a career, I find it disappointing. I say, actually, there's nothing of value in this world. Why work hard at all? Just, just forget all this hard work. Just, you know, you can drink and enjoy life and forget everything else. So when Prabhupada went to America, there was a counterculture. And the counterculture was basically that life, all the goals that society had set for them. You know, get an education, get a job, have a family, get respect and preparation of society. That's the point of it all. It doesn't make it anywhere. It's just a show. I don't want all this. And he just rebelled against it. So now here, fortunately for her, for this queen, the Lord is coming and the Lord is guiding her at that point. The Lord is going to take her towards Paramartha. So essentially, you know, when things in front of us go wrong, at that time, we look up. Now, when we look up, there are broadly three options before us. We can call this by the acronym FAN. That whoever is up there, either that person is favorable to me or that person is against me. Or third option is that person is just neutral. That person doesn't care. And as a variant of that option is that person is non-existent. So ultimately, these are three options we have. Either someone up there is there, someone, something, whatever overarching, that is there and that is favorable to me. Or that is just doesn't care about me. Or is against me. So now, among these three options, we have to choose one of the other, one of the other options. Now, we may not consciously think about this, but when we function the world, some people say, you know, okay, even if God is there, God is not going to help you. You have to work yourself. But the idea is, even if he is there, it doesn't matter. So we all have some or other of these worldviews in which we function. When I started practicing bhakti or 30 years ago, that I started sharing with all my relatives and friends. So he, so one of my uncles, uh, when I told him about Krishna consciousness, about me, he said, no, I believe in God. He's, he's happy that I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is, I don't need it, and he doesn't have to intervene in my life. I don't care for it. So basically, he's like, in God is neutral, I don't care. So essentially, the journey that we are going to go through, if you forget everything of this series of classes, this one image is what we're going to come back again and again in the session. See, initially for us, in your life journey, the world is big for us. The world is what is Artha for us. And God, even if he exists, he's small for us. <coughs> but as we grow spiritually, the world becomes small for us and God becomes big for us. So this is the essence of spiritual advancement. 
spiritual advancement doesn't mean we reject the world as Maya. It doesn't mean that we abandon the world. It just means that we understand that there is a reality bigger than this world. And not only understand it, for us, that reality becomes bigger. So how will this happen? That is what we are going to discuss. So here the Lord is intervening and the Lord is guiding her to go from Artha towards Paramartha. So before we talk about that journey of going from Artha towards Paramartha, let's look at some of the ways in which some of the things that may obstruct us in going towards Paramartha. Some of the ways in which we might miss out on moving towards Parma. So the 4.10, the 4.78 that the Gita is, Krishna is sending a Rautar, that's Sambhavami Yuga Yuga, that's what I'm talking about. Then 4.9 is Janma Karma Chamei Dirgyam. And 4.10 is Vitaragavaya Krodha Manmaya Mahupashitava Bahavo Gyanit Tapasa Bhuta Madhava Mangataha. So Krishna is telling that if we want to turn towards him, Manmaya Mahupashitava, we want to take shelter of him, become absorbed in him. And there are three things which we need to do. Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha. So we look at this Raga Bhaya Krodha in terms of so for so overall for our entire course, this is the diagram which you're going to come back to. We were going to see how we can go along this journey by which we can make God bigger. And then for each session within that, we have one diagram which will summarize more or less what is going to be there in the session. So this is A four quadrant diagram. In general, there are many worldviews in this world. But many people, different people have different philosophies, different religions, different ideologies, whatever it is. But within that, we can say that there is this world or the world of matter, the material world. And there is the other world or the spiritual level. It's called this material level. Now, this is real. This is unreal. This is real or unreal. So broadly, the worldviews that are possible, they can be put in these four categories. This world is real. And there's another world that is real. This world is real, and there is no such thing as another world. Uh, neither is this world real, nor is the other world real. And this world is real, or this world is false, but there's another world that is real. So basically, the, the thing which Krishna is telling us to give up, so we call this as one, two, three, and four. So this is the worldview of Raga. This is materialism. This is the worldview that is most present, prevalent right now in the world. So, Raga, we can translate in English as desire. So, I'll talk about these as in terms of four Ds. So, this is the first worldview. And this, the, all our desires are caught in this world. And then, and if our desires are caught in this world, there is no need. This world is real. That's all that matters. Then there is neither this world real nor is the other world real. This is a very dark worldview. This is called as nihilism. Nihilism may not be a very common word, but Prabhupada refers to Shunya or Voidism. So, so this is the worldview of Bhaya. This is in English we can translate dread, not just fear. But it is like an existential, very deep rooted fear. Fear can come and go, but dread is something which lasts for a long time. 
sorry this is not dread this is despair and this is not bhaya it is actually krodha mm -hmm. so krodha why because at this point the person thinks nothing really nothing has any value at all everything that anybody has told me it's all false the religious people told me that there is a god they are lying materialistic people told me that you earn money and you get position and fame and you will be happy they are also like so everybody is basically like but this is the world view of great skepticism so this is where there is no hope left in life among all the world views this is the most dark world view it you can't really do here so this is nihilism then this is the world view of impersonalism or so nirvishesha shunyavadi pashyanti deshadare so pashyanti was largely raga materialism nirvishesha and shunyavadi is impersonalism and voidism so impersonalism often it is called as monism monism means only one substance is real only one thing exists and they think the only reality is spiritual reality there's one non differentiated brahman is there and there is nothing beyond that so this is the world view of this leads to bhaya why bhaya because it is the whole world is simply maya and whatever looks attractive in this world it is all simply meant to trap us and because it's all meant to trap us the more you try to enjoy it traps you always be careful don't be attracted to anything in this world and because the other world there is not although we say the other world is real but there is really nothing attractive to focus on that so the primary emotion becomes great Live in constant fear of this world and its entanglement, and then so Krishna is saying, "Be the rag ayangro. We need to go beyond these three worldviews. Then we can come to the worldview of bhakti. So bhakti, be the rag ayangro. The man maya mam upashanta, bahavo gyan tapasa, bhuta man bhava akta." so this is the world view of bhava or based on that particular words bhava or bhakti so this is devotion and we can call it prabhupad uses this word in an early back to god magazine devotionalism or if you want to stick to the ism or in this kind of gita world view bhakti world view so we want to go from wherever we are not none of these world views we want to go towards the Should be, and <clears throat> there can of course be many variants in the specifics. But the devotional world view is that this world is real. At the same time, this world is not the ultimate reality. This world is real, and this other world, which is a bigger reality, and it is not that. by running away from this world we go to the other world it is by functioning in this world by acting through this world that we go to the other so now among these four world views now many people often say that they say i philosophy doesn't interest me very much and now it students also study how many students will really take philosophy as elective when they want to. unless they are very specially interested not many people do that but although we may never have consciously studied philosophy but what happens is everybody has some way of making sense of life now one simple definition of philosophy or what is the need of philosophy basically see philosophy is help it helps us to make sense when it helps us to make sense when things don't make sense 
So in the normal course of life, okay, if I study, I get good marks. If I work at my job, I get a raise. You know, I seek a relationship and I get some reciprocation. Then I don't feel the need for philosophy. But when things don't make sense, when I'm pursuing some artha and I get that artha, then what is the need for going towards the philosophy? Okay, I'm getting it. It's fair enough. But when we pursue artha, and what we get is anartha. That's when things don't make sense. And that's when we start looking for philosophy. So now we all have faced situations in our life to some smaller or larger degrees when things don't make sense. And we have found our own ways of dealing with it. Most people, when one object of artha in this world goes away from them, they either start chasing that same artha again or they start chasing some other artha. Like if say somebody in the outer one suddenly dies because of the sickness, then they may decide, okay, you know, I just didn't have enough money. Other I would have taken them some other country, I would have given them great treatment and they would have been saved. Then that person may decide, I am going to spend my life earning enough money so that you will never have any financial problems. So well, that's one way of dealing with it. And yes, sometimes money can make a difference. Money is also art. But that is not necessarily going to solve the problem. Somebody loses a loved one to cancer, and we say, okay, I'm going to get into medicine, I'm going to do cancer research, and I'm going to find a cure. That's a noble thing to do. But what has happened is that one artha was lost, they made that particular thing their art. And that's nice. Somebody, somebody, different people can choose different things as their art. But still, even if we cure all forms of cancer, we don't want to cure death. So, when the artha is lost, at that time, we need to turn towards Paramartha. So, among these three, among these four worldviews, just replacing one artha with another material artha. So, that is not a lasting solution. That is what most people do. They, uh, and now, on the other hand, thinking that there is nothing of Artha, that's a terrible worldview. There's no Artha in this life, there's no Artha in another life. There was a European existentialist philosopher, Albert Dukam. He was quite intelligent, but unfortunately, he had this, he was living in this second quadrant. So he said, existence is suffering. And the more you try to alleviate the suffering, the worse it becomes. You say, hey, this seems like only the philosophy. To some extent, Dukkha Ushadam Tadadati Dukkha Maskalan says. But then his conclusion was for him there is no conception of Paramatma. So he said, therefore, the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. <laughs> so the philosopher, he said, every time I pass by the window of a third story building, I have to resist the temptation of jumping out. What kind of life is that? <laughs> you know, occasionally, when people are very frustrated, they may, they may have just what is the point of living at all? Often, suicide there can be many specific sociological causes for it, but it is when well, suicide is basically the triumph of despair over hope. See, we all need some hope in our life, something to look forward to. But in this worldview, there is nothing to look forward to. This is the darkest worldview. And when we talk about worldviews, some people may adopt a worldview philosophically. That means they actually think, analyze, and they arrive at a worldview. Like earlier I said that when we talk about a worldview, the worldview can be approached, arrived at through philosophical deliberation. That means the person thinks, analyzes, and comes to the conclusion of that. But sometimes that philosophy worldview might just be their psychological orientation, psychological disposition. That's how they start. That's how they think. Like if you ask people, is materialism your worldview? Many people may not even know what materialism is. And they may be materialistic living. But that's just the way their mind is functioning. 
They have not really thought about the world view, but their mind is going in that direction. So like that, this nihilism, the world view, nothing matters. But that is not a world view that many people have consciously chosen. But psychologically, many people, especially in the West, youth are living like that now. And there are many people, what is the point of living at all? And they say, okay, life is, as a whole movement, we say, we don't want to have any children at all. Why? Because this world is so much suffering, our planet is so much burdened by humans. I don't want to bring one more human being into this world who's only going to burden the planet and who's going to live a life full of suffering. Now, it's called the antenatal movement. Natalism is having children, antenatal movement. But so people need to have someone to give affection. So in some of the biggest cities in America, in LA, San Francisco, among white Caucasians, the number of pets is more than the number of children. You say, I don't want to have children. But then people have someone they want to lavish their affection on. So nobody can actually live nihilistically. You may claim to live like that. But you say, I don't want to have children. But you, know, you have to have someone, some, some artha we have to have. So then they'll adopt a pet and that will become their artha in life. So nihilism, somebody is going there, they have to come up. Some artha you need to find. Something of me, even if it is not Paramartha. See, sometimes we equate Rajamuna and Tamamuna. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we say Rajamuna and Tamamuna are all bad. From a spiritual perspective, that is true. But from a material perspective, Rajamuna is much better than Tamamuna. Because in Rajamuna, a person at least has some Asamartha. I want to take care of my family. I want to have this job. Paramartha, sorry, when uh, Tamaguna, person has no material artha. I just want to play video games all day. I just want to drink. I want to do drugs. So, some artha is better than no artha. In that sense, we can say, even the worldview of materialism is better than the worldview of nihilism. Now, the worldview of impersonalism, that is more reactionary. Reactionary means what? That when a person pursues some artha in this world and when they end up getting a lot of suffering. So, when they end up getting a lot of suffering, they think that actually, oh, this whole world is full of suffering. They just have to stay away from this world. And there is some, in life, there's some reality, but the way to get to that reality is just completely declare everything in this world to be false. Now, again, see, the other world is quite far away from most of us. And if we just go to turn away from everything in this world, it's a very difficult way to live. So, some people might be able to live like this, but for most people, treating this world as Maya and and having nothing to do with it is not a practical. So we, there is this world, there is another world. And that other world, ultimate reality is God, God as a person. So that Krishna, that ultimate reality, whatever name we may refer to. So basically, if I, I started by talking about this fan, FA. So now I talk, I went from there to these four worldviews. So now if we want to come toward this worldview of devotionalism, that when Artha is taken away from us, at that time, we want to move towards Paramahar. So how do we do that? How do we, okay, there is some higher reality and I would like to connect with that higher reality. How do we even appreciate that God exists or God cares? So I talk about two things and we will build on this in tomorrow's session. But with this, I'll conclude over here that basically for us, we often see God's presence or God, that when we look at God's blessings in our life, we generally look for two things. We look for gifts in life. 
you know, okay, something worked out very nicely. You know, I was not getting any job, but suddenly I got this job. Or I was not getting cured at all. And suddenly I found I this particular thing worked out and got cured. We look for gifts in life. And that's fair enough. But there's even more fundamental. There is the gift of life. There is gifts in life. But there is the gift of life. In 15.12 to 15 in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about Jnana Chakshu. Utkramantam Sitam Vapi Bhunjanam Vagunatitam Vimukha Nanu Pashyanti Pashyanti Jnana Chakshu Shaha He says, with the eyes of knowledge, we can see the spiritual in the material. We can see the divine in this world. So basically, for us, when something good happens in our life, that's when we think maybe there is some God over there, maybe some God in that reality. So, and that is there. But before that, the, the fact of life itself is a remarkable miracle. Our bodies are so fragile, our knowledge is so finite. So many things can go wrong in the world. The fact that each one of us is alive, that itself is a miracle. If we look at our bodies, so many things need to work right for our body itself to function. In many ways, if somebody studies science objectively, we start realizing how complicated our body is we start understanding how complicated the universe is. And so many things need to work out in such precise ways for our existence to be possible. So, in this series of verses from 15, 12, 13, 14, and 15, so all chapter 15 in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about the various levels at which we can appreciate his existence. So he says that it is I who arrange for the light of the sun by which the whole of existence is illuminated in society. So this is at the cosmological level. Mm -hmm. The cosmic level, the scientists have found out so many factors. Like the Earth, the Earth had been a little closer to the sun, it would have been too hot for us. The Earth had been a little far away from us. Again, the world would have been too cold for life as we know to exist. So if the sun had been a little brighter, it wouldn't have existed. So there are so many factors involved which actually make the existence possible. So then, Krishna talks in the next verse at the level of the earth. Terrestrial level. Gama vishya cha bhutani bharayami amojasa pushyami chaushali sarva tomu bhutvara satma kama So he says it is I who sustain the earth. So, what science calls as gravity, how does it actually work? What is the mechanism for it? Ultimately, it's Krishna's agent. And Krishna says, it is I who sustain the vegetables. It is I who provide food stuffs to us. So, it's one miracle that we as our bodies are sustained by the cosmological arrangement. But the food that we need, it's a miracle that our bodies exist and nature exists where food that we can eat is there. So, how does all this work out? Now, we may say, I work hard and that's how I get, get food on my table. It's true. But our efforts are secondary. So, if we study history, one of the first lessons that history teaches is humility. Now, there are rivers which can dry up. Entire civilizations can disappear within one generation. 
वन अर्थक और वन वोलो कैन कम अप एंड like no plants would actually be able to grow there would be no photosynthesis there would not be there would not be food to eat for us so there are so many arrangements on the earth if we have so many food processing industries we don't have any food producing industry the only food producing industry is god's nature everything that we process it has to start with god's nature so there is food producing industry now there's many people who are more into industry natural living they say eat food produced eat food made of plants not food made in plants <laughs> so it's not, it's not just from a health perspective it also reminds us that you know food producing industry the only one is god's nature so the gift of life itself in some minute and then the next verse krishna talks at the physiological level physiological level is he says even the nature produces food it's not we who digest food it is what he says is that is aham vaishwana ro bhutva praninam dehaam ashitam pranam anasama yukta pachamyannam chaturvidham It is I who has a digestive fire. I have digest the food. Now, see the only time we think of our digestion is when it doesn't work. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just food, eat food, and enjoy life. But actually, digestion is itself a miracle. The scientists are trying to, when the body cells, the parts don't work, we try to create some replacements for it. And those scientists who do it, they are doing a lot of research, and the effort needs to be lauded. Somebody has prosthetic limbs, somebody has a pacemaker, and the dialysis unit, and nowadays if somebody has cognitive damage, but there are neural chips can be implanted that people have some level of function. So their intelligence has to be lauded definitely. At the same time, if so many scientists need to do so much research to to replicate the functionality. It is already available to each one of us. And if we appreciate the scientists who replicate the functionality, how much do we appreciate the original scientist who has created the functionality? Now, even with all that, replacing the digestive functionality is extremely difficult. So, digestion involves so many complicated mechanisms. Scientists have said, if if somebody can't digest food, they try to create an artificial digestive machine. It won't be a machine; it will be a factory. It's, it's it's very complicated. So the point is, there are many arrangements that enable our existence. So the gift of life. Sometimes we feel I don't have this gift in life. I don't. This person is fairer than me. This person is taller than me. This person is smarter than me. And this person, whatever. We we may look at the gifts that we don't have in our life. And he's asking, "Where is God?" But the gift of life itself is a big miracle. And when we appreciate this, then we start seeing that there is a higher reality, and that higher reality is integral to me. That's how I have the gift of life. And now, specifically about the gifts in life, when they are lacking. Or when they are taken away from us, how do we see that? That we will discuss in tomorrow's session. But the key point is that at the foundation level, if we understand life itself is a is a great gift, then we will see that there must be someone out there. Now, why might they take the gift away from me at a particular time? What what is the exact reasoning going on? That is something worth questioning and exploring. 
But just because some gift has been taken away from us does not mean that it was not a gift while it was there. The fact that we have it, even for some time, that, that is a gift and that can at least open us the possibility that there is a higher reality. And if what they have given me is a gift, that means that that higher reality is real and this world in which I have been given gifts is also real. So in that worldview, Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha, Man Maya How we can actually fix the mind of Krishna and make Krishna a real reality. That we discuss in our session tomorrow. I'll summarize what I discussed today. Broadly, we are going on this journey. We are going on this journey of what we can call as spiritual growth or spiritual developing our relationship with Krishna. Seeing how God is acting in our life and how we can respond. So I first talk about the overview of what we are going to do in the three sessions. So basically, I talked about act. A was first we appreciate Krishna's role in our life. Then we connect with him because we see he's doing something valuable for us. And finally, we target him in the sense that he becomes the ultimate purpose of our life. So in general, for all of us, the essential choice in life is we all have some artha. And when that artha is, it either turns out to be an artha because it's a disappointment. It doesn't turn out to be as good as we thought it was. Or it turns out to be a devastation that is all taken away from us. So the essential choice is whether we go towards paramartha. Okay, what is the ultimate meaning in my life? Or we go down towards anartha. So in that connection, how do we go about in different ways? I talked about, so this was the first start. The incident was, now this queen has lost her husband. And the Lord has come in the form of a sakha, a friend, to guide her at that particular time. So the Lord is guiding her at the time of when her artha has gone to move towards Paramartha. So this is where we want to go. This is where we don't want to go. And within that, we can we talk about dispositions in two different ways. One is in terms of, say, if I am here, there is the world in front of me, and then there is God above me. Mm -hmm. So, and the world. So with respect to God, we can have three options. Either is, what is F.A.M.? You may remember? Favorable, against, neutral, or just non-existent. These are three ways of looking at God. And with respect to the world, we talk about these four quadrants. That either this world is real, and the other world is real. And conversely, this world is false, or the other world is false. So this is materialism. And that is the worldview of desire. This is rag. And this is neither world is real. Materialism is the most prominent worldview in today's world. So people can have a worldview either through philosophical deliberation or simply through psychological disposition. That's just the way their mind functions, that's the way they live. So for many people, it's not philosophical, but it's a psychological, that's the way they're living. Then this is, and you remember the word for this? Nihilism or voidism, nothing matters. This is the worldview of despair. Krodha. Krodha is not really anger, it's over. It is like existential frustration with life. This is the darkest worldview. One has to get out of it. We need some artha in life at all. Then that's the worldview of monism or impersonalism. This is the worldview of dread, fire. That, okay, this world is all Maya, they're all entangled and trapped. I just have to run away from it. And then we have the worldview of Bhakti, devotionalism. That is the worldview of Bhava. Hmm. So this world is real, and the next world is also real. So we want to turn away from all these worldviews, and we want to turn towards the worldview of devotionalism. This world is real, and the other world also is real. 
and how do we turn a turn towards this world view? It is by by observation. We observe our life, and uh, we look for God's blessings in one way mainly. That is, we look for the gifts in life. And while that is a fair enough way to look at it, but an, another fundamental way is the gift of life. Life itself is a gift. And that we discussed based on Bhagavad Gita 12, 13, 14, that our existence to, for it to be sustained, there is cosmic arrangement in terms of the sun. There is terrestrial arrangement in terms of the earth existing in space and the earth having uh, foodstuffs for us. And there is physiological arrangement in terms of the digestive system. So there are so many factors that have to work for us to even exist for whatever time we exist. So at least for us, we can say, that maybe there is some being out there who's watching out for you. That's how I can have any life at all. Now, why would that being stop watching out for us? Or why would that being stop caring for us? That's something open that's worth deliberating, which we do in our next session. But this is the world with this. This is Jnana Chakshu. Jnana Chakshu, the eyes of knowledge, where we see the hand of God in this world. And to the extent we see the hand of God in this world, to that extent, we can start opening ourselves towards developing a relationship with the Lord. That key diagram is going to be the defining discussion for us. It's initially for us, the world is big and God is small. Eventually, the world becomes small and the God will become big. So this is what we would like to move towards and how we will go in this direction. We'll discuss in our future sessions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. Raga Hair Krodha. Weak means to be free from. That's not a word. You that is weak. Weak means to give up. Okay. Yes. Okay. If we observe most of our life's uh, motivations, they strongly come from the uh, fire growth and Fire growth and raga. So, how do we keep the same level of passion when we are looking at when life is devoid of this thing? How do we direct our passion towards this real world without that attachment of fear and all those things? Okay. Now, bhakti is not necessarily without raga bhaya krodha. See, within bhakti also, there are many different rasas. There are the five prominent rasas. That is the more like, they are overall uh, nature of the relationship itself. Like, shang, sakhya, vatsalya, madhuri, that. But then after that, there is, within bhakti also, there are varieties of emotions. There is vibhatsa, there is bhayanaka. There is horror, there is joy, there is fear, there is, uh, there is humor. So, bhakti is filled with various emotions. So, that Raga Bhaya Krodha, when Mother Yashoda, she has great attachment to Krishna. And she sees Krishna high up, thrown out this scale, carrying Krishna. She's terrified, she's getting burned by her. What's happened over here? So, there is emotion, definitely. And if you look at the Rama and when, when Ram is uh, exiled, there is Krodha in Lakshman. This is unfair. He said, we should not be happening. So it's not that those emotions are all rejected. It is that the various emotions that we have, they are accommodated within the framework of Bhakti. So for all of us, ultimately Bhakti, it is also 
to be it is not just devotion and peace and joy it's a real relationship and a real relationship has many different emotions in it it is if you decide to organize a festival for krishna then there's anxiety over here you know this food has to be prepared this traffic has to be there this parking has to be taken care of this activity this has to be done but within that that go through going through that emotions our connection with krishna becomes deeper our absorbing with krishna becomes deeper so the emotions that we have in this world we try to direct them toward krishna and it is not that we have to turn away from the world to direct them toward krishna we can even offer krishna things in this world so when we try to do something tangible for krishna's service then our emotions invested in doing that and in that way we can have emotional fulfillment or emotional energization through or within the parameter of bhakti also okay thank you yes please okay Thank you. So, is it correct to understand that Buddhism has created a lot of fear and, and all the things that are just lying around here? Um, to historical origins, it's difficult to say because the Shankaracharya started that. But you know, Shankaracharya people before Shankaracharya also that philosophy was there. Shankaracharya was like a systematizer or a very prominent teacher, like Bhakti or what you call as uh, Advain, uh, Vaishnav Bhakti. It existed before Shri Vaishnav is what we call it. It was not that Ramanya started it. It existed before Ramanacharya also. But many of the Alvars existed long before Ramanacharya. So, I'm not sure whether we could make that case in terms of historical origin that it started out of fear. But in terms of individual, there is definitely some level of fear that is a prominent emotion within the psychological genesis, psychological origin or adoption of that particular worldview by individuals at particular times. So definitely there is fear over there. Now, this is not to dismiss that philosophy because whatever be the emotion that might originate that philosophy, Afterwards, see the human intelligence, or the, there is manna and buddhi within us. And ideally speaking, the buddhi should guide the manna. The intelligence should guide the mind. But there are many times when the mind controls the intelligence, and then the mind doesn't just control, the mind uses the intelligence. So when the mind uses the intelligence, what happens is, then whatever worldview we may have adopted for whatever reason, using our intelligence, we can come up a lot for not come up with a lot of justifications for it. So impersonalism or even materialism for that matter can be developed into an elaborate thought system. And when we are talking with people who are advocates of a particular philosophy, you know, if we simply while talking with them, start saying this is just a philosophy that has come out of desire or fear or despair, that they may think we are being too religionistic or disrespectful to them. Because they may have built a whole world of you around it. And uh, so it so the point is we could we could definitely make that claim in terms of that as not even claim the assertion in terms of psychologically how a philosophy is accepted by a particular person or proposed by a particular person. But eventually they can build it into a whole philosophical uh, system where there's a lot of buddhi that is used in that direction. Thank you. 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 So sometimes what is the 13 14 the 15 point 12 13 times the battery so um, since it is an abundance then we might take we take it for granted because we feel that what is special that everybody is having the same right uh, so i uh, we until that is it is taken away that you said when the digestion is not fine then only you think about it or when we see people inferior to us then we think about okay yes and god has given us this gift 
So how do we appreciate that in our day-to-day -day life, uh, in normal situations? How do we appreciate? Yeah, and just talk about appreciation. When we talk about gratitude, in general, when something extraordinary happens, it's relatively easy to feel grateful. If somebody wins the lottery ticket, it's very easy to feel grateful. So gratitude for the extraordinary in one sense is ordinary. Gratitude for the ordinary is extraordinary. So it is not easy to appreciate what is ordinary. Yes, sir. We need to do some reflection with our buddhi. That is now, see, many people like to be in touch with the news, breaking news here, breaking news there. Then we call it breaking news. But often it is the news of how things are breaking down in various parts of the world. So, especially since I started traveling across the world, I feel like there's so many things which we just take for granted in our day to day life. And not so easy to develop. I was in Scotland and just many devotees from Ukraine had come as immigrants over there. And then it just, they were just practicing bhakti, they had their life, they had their society. And suddenly everything is devastated. Now they have to come there and build a whole new life. There are so many things which we have, which are dependent on so many factors beyond our control. And I started going to America and I started doing outreach to American youth. No, I, actually, my gratitude for my parents started increasing so much more. Because parenting is a very tough thing. And I'm not blaming Americans because America is a very large country. But many times, people have so many issues. You know, parental neglect, parental abuse. There are tam tamasic parents. Uh, sometimes we may criticize parents for being materialistic. But even if a parent is Rajasik, Oh, if the child is sick, they will move heaven and earth to heal their child and to cure their child. But they may have no, they may have no belief in God or no interest in becoming devoted to God. But still, at least they are taking care at that level. And in general, in Eastern culture. Eastern in India, China, these places, there is that much conservative values there that parenting is a serious response. Sometimes children may feel it's too, parents are being too overbearing. But that's one issue, but at least they're caring. In the West, it's like, I'm not again generalizing all of this, but it's some of it. If Tamasic parent is there, the parent is stoned on drugs. And the parent doesn't even know why child is existing. The one devotee told me that you know, his father just left him. Soon after his birth, his mother took starting in drugs. He said, from the age of five till the age of 16, I was taking care of my mother. You know, I would go to the America, the welfare country. So if you don't have a job, you don't have money, then you go to the place where the soup kitchen or the welfare office, get a check, you get food. So now, now whatever difficulties we may have had with our parents, with our siblings, you know, it's, there's a lot that was right in our lives. So basically, if we meet, when we just read news, we just read them as events. When we meet different people, we just say how different they are. But then when we meet different people and we hear about different things, we can start appreciating that there are so many things. The fabric of society is that there's so much, so much that was right in our life. So it does require reflection. So if we have some people with whom we can do that reflection a little bit, uh, uh, a deliberation, then that can help us stay grounded and grateful. But it's not easy. It's, it's easy to get caught in the particular things which we want. Now we may want it even for Krishna's sake, but still we want them. If we don't get them, then we get agitated. Okay. So we'll continue tomorrow. And tomorrow we'll be discussing about how we can, once we appreciate that God exists, how can we start connecting with Him? What does connecting with Him mean practically? And especially how do we stay connected with Him when the gifts in our life seem to be going up and down? And last session, it's not just about connecting, how can we, Krishna, 
अल्टीमेटली आने की ओर बात आए थैंक यू वेरी मच श्री कृष्ण भगवान की श्री दत्त गोपाल की